All right. Hello, everyone. Hello. How are you guys doing? Hola. How's it going, everyone? Now, this is really exciting. We've wanted to do this for a while because we have been working on that course for, for a long time, and this is just a nice way to uh, to close it out and then also to be able to talk with, with you guys, whoever's listening. Um, and so if you have any questions, we would love to answer them. We encourage you to drop them in the chat as we go through. Um, but we have a couple sections here. We'll do a, a spot where we can play some games with everybody. We'll talk about some of our favorite parts about this and we'll have a longer Q&A section at the end. But Colin will be monitoring the chat. Uh, and yeah, so we encourage you to drop stuff in there as we as we go along. But first, uh, before we get into it too much, we should introduce who is on the stream and kind of what we've been doing while you're looking at the four of us. So I think you you guys probably know uh, Colin and me, but um, you know we are the BC High guys. And um, but yeah, we'll so we'll start with uh, Forrest and and Michael. Forrest, hey go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm Forrest. I was helping out with the audio editing and the writing for the course, and I'll pass it on to Michael. Hey, I'm Mike, and I was the video editor. And yeah. Yeah, so all of those, yeah, these guys put in a, a tremendous amount of work. I mean, we all did, but you know, you've seen the you've seen the videos, all those little animations and all that that fun stuff that has been Mike and then Forrest has helped out a lot with the scripting and stuff. So did we uh what happened? Oh, we gotta we gotta we gotta freeze there. You we good? Did? Yep. I think yeah, we're, we're good, good now. Sorry, <laughs> um but yeah, no, this is uh, oh. Harrison, can you pull the gain up just a tad on the on the desktop audio? Yeah. Yes, I can. Um, cool. I'm gonna hold on one sec. Yeah. It says my internet connection is unstable, so I'm gonna work on. So yeah, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how the BCI's got BCI guys got founded here. Um, so in 2018, in fall of 2018, uh, Harrison and I met on campus at RIT. Uh, we started a research group. Um, called the Neurotechnology Exploration Team, um, and we—it's uh, basically that's that's how it's all started. Uh, we, it was a student-run research group uh, where we did experiments with brain-computer interfacing, so that's with uh, electroencephalography, electromyography, um, and we got to do a bunch of really cool experiments uh, like making race cards move and stuff by just thinking about it or by using electromyography, which is muscle activation. Um, Forrest was a part of that research group as well. Um, uh, and yeah, it was, it was a great time. And that sort of led to us. Yeah. Um, before, but before we get into that, um, I just want to, I just do want to say uh, too, that this was what NXT really became for us. So it started as, as a research thing, but it really kind of sparked in us this, um, desire and interest in bringing other people into, into the space. Because we started this, we thought it would be a small thing at, at RIT. And by the end of our first year, we had a little over 20 people doing uh, research, uh, research work, and then 80 people overall that were just kind of like coming to the meetings and stuff. And so um, we noticed that there's a lot of interest in this stuff and we love talking about it. And so, um, yeah, as we're getting into at the start of uh, once the pandemic kind of rolled around and we needed to find a new way to reach people, uh, we had this idea of the BCI guys and um, as a way that we could create educational and entertaining content to be able to reach a broader audience. Um, and that has been our mission since and what we plan to do going forward. Anything that you wanted to add on that, Colin? No, that's pretty much it. Um, it was really exciting to, to see sort of the hype behind this technology. And I think that um, uh, one of the, the main driving factors that we had with BCI guys was sort of sharing this technology with the world and getting it out there. So uh, that's the our, our sort of mission, mission statement moving forward here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for the rest of the stream, we will talk, uh, we'll talk about the course a lot. So in our production of making that, um, quiz you guys a little bit. We'll have some opportunities to win some merch. Um, and then uh, some open questions that, that we can all answer. And then, of course, um, the part that I'm most excited for, we have some bloopers that Michael threw together um, that, uh, that we haven't seen yet. So I'm really excited to, to see what those look like. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I think I just want to talk generally about just neurotechnology in, in, in general, because like the reason that, that we're here and that uh, hopefully you guys watching it here a vision that we all have for the future of what this technology can bring. I mean, right now it's already doing tremendous things in terms of 
uh, helping people with disabilities. Um, neuromodulation technologies are helping with chronic pain and showing promise to help with mental, mental health uh, challenges and other neurological issues, which is all really exciting. And then in the future, I think we can all imagine how cool and then also just useful and beneficial it will be to be able to add brain controlled elements. I mean, for me, it's always been this idea of creating technology that is more human, that, that works with us um, and in more human ways, so multi-sensorial ways. So instead of looking at a two-dimensional screen, we're interacting with feeling, touching data in, in a different way, which sounds a little bit weird, but I think that it's, uh, it's, it's a really exciting future and that's kind of what, uh, what drives us. So I want to talk, uh, I'll throw it over to, to Colin actually, but I want to talk a little bit about what the future of our channel looks like. Because obviously we've worked on this course and we'll spend the rest of today talking about that, but we plan on sticking around for a long time. We love making this content. And so uh, I want to uh, talk about what we're going to do going forward. Yeah, so obviously the course was our first really big project, right? Like, so it took a lot of effort to write out those scripts and uh, make sure everything was really high production quality. We actually got to meet Michael Abbott here. So Michael is our editor. Uh, he, he does a great job on um, the yeah. uh, I mean, you guys have seen content. Them. They're phenomenal. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> hey, thanks guys. <laughs> uh, Forrest also handled a lot of audio correction stuff. Uh, so he's done a lot of audio engineering as well as um, sort of vetting the, the content of the course just to make sure that everything we're saying is factually correct, uh, which is obviously an important part of an education platform. Um, and yeah, and Harrison and I are the, the, the both the writers and the, um, I, I, don't, I don't know what, you, what you, you, you'd you call us, the, the guys on screen. Um, the guys, <laughs> yes. The, 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 the two guys. Um, but in the future, we want to make uh, content that's sort of similar to that EDU stuff, but more leaning into the educate or more leaning into the entertainment side as well. So we've made a lot of really cool projects uh, in our time working with brain computer interfaces. Like I mentioned, like RC cars moving around and that sort of thing. Uh, and we want to take a lot of those interesting projects that we've done and sort of turn them into video content. Um, and so one one that we kind of have on the backlog right now is, I, I'm, I'm fine with talking about it if you yeah, are. Yeah, go ahead. Harrison is, go ahead. Um, so we're working on things like, like Tinder swipers. So like if you're like staring at somebody on a screen and you find them attractive, it swipes right on Tinder for you. Stuff, super fun, uh, brain controlled experiments like that is sort of our, our goal for the future of this project uh, of this of this channel. Um, yeah. So we want to keep pumping out really high quality, interesting, um, sort of hacky videos um, that that we hope you guys will find interesting. Yeah, so that's so that's one uh, content. Uh, that's one content type that we have. Um, so you can see on the on the screen here that we've got projects, which is what Colin just talked about. So those are going to be sort of hackery makery videos. Um, and then we're doing brain bits, which you may have seen. These are for YouTube shorts. They'll be for TikTok and Instagram as well. These are the vertical style format videos. Um, and for these, we want to try to break down neurotechnology and neuroscience topics in less than 60 seconds. Um, and then the topic videos as well are going to be covering neurotechnology news um, or diving in depth into a topic that uh, people ask us to make a video about. So. For example, a couple that we're working on right now, one of them is about next steps in neurotech. We've asked, we've gotten so many questions about what should I study if I want to go into neurotech? What are, what different jobs could I get? What should I, what should I do next? What resources, what universities, all this stuff. So we're trying to address that um, in the video. And so there'll be little things like that. Um, this is where we cover Neuralink or, or other things as well. And so this is for our, our core content that will be, um, coming out regularly. And we want to get to a sustainable model around that stuff. Um, and so we're just about to get into the groove with that. But in the future, we will have uh, other projects as well um, that are more in depth, just like uh, just like Foundations of Neurotechnology was. So there could be more courses in the future. We have a couple ideas in the back burner for that. Um, but BCI Guy's goal in general is just to be the mouth of the neurotech industry. Our biggest goal is to get more people talking about neurotech. And so if we can do that in an exciting way that engages something in popular culture like Tinder or whatever it is, then that's great because we get to pull people down the pipeline and hopefully it's it's interesting for everyone to watch too. Um, but, and you know, I know that you know, everyone everyone knew this was coming at some point, but um, we are, you know, we are trying to make this model sustainable. Colin and I are doing this full time. Um, and so we are, uh, you know, looking for any support that you guys can, can provide either on Patreon. We have some cool merch, which I'll get into in a second. Um, but there are other non-monetary ways uh, 
as well that you can participate in terms of submitting ideas. One of the biggest things you can do is just share our videos and get them around, um, or if you have certain qualifications to, to join the team. Um, but like I said, uh, if you are able to contribute at all, whether it's by merch or, or through Patreon, that really helps us so that we can uh, continue to pay Mike and try to pay him a little more adequately for the stuff <laughs> that he's doing and get with and you know designers and stuff as well and just get better equipment you know we're not looking to make a profit from this but just to not have it be a huge uh, hole in both <laughs> Colin and my uh, wallets here but uh, but yeah so this is just some of the the merch I really like this this mug and stuff um, and then uh, if you have content ideas you can you can put that down down below um, so yeah, go. You can take a look at that at bciguys.com backslash support. Yeah, definitely send those video uh, ideas our way because we love to hear from you guys and we want to make content that you guys are interested in. So, um, you know, definitely, definitely send those our way. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I'm gonna put it back to just the the four of us on the screen and we can just talk about the making of the course. Do we have any questions or anything yet? Do we want to take a pause for that? Yeah, does it does anybody in chat have questions? There are. I've seen a lot of chats going through here, so we should. We have uh Marcelo is interested in neuro law. Uh that's definitely Ooh. an interesting topic. Uh, mm. Marcelo, if you wouldn't mind sending your contact information our way, we'd love to talk to you about that in a future video. Um once again, go to that bciguys.com slash support. Uh, that would be great, and just uh, submit your contact information. We'd love to, to talk yeah. to you about that. That sounds something that Forrest would be all over. I'm excited about <laughs> that, too. Yeah. I mean, you're not wrong about that, but um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm required to say that. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, but that would be something that would be really interesting to to dive into, for sure. And we're really interested in just, like, ethics and stuff as well. Um, we're working on some content in, in the background of, with that stuff because, and that's part of the reason that we're doing these videos as well is to make people aware of this because it feels like there's an ethical imperative to let people know that these brain devices are coming so that we can all construct the future that we want. Um, I'm looking through here, I see Cyrus uh, says, I didn't know about the course. Yeah, so we have a full, um, I think 21 videos in the course that are kind of built in like a crash course style uh, format and we actually have, which we'll talk about at the end, a bunch of written content coming to tons and tons of pages that uh, if you're really interested in diving into a specific topic, you can take a take, uh, keep a lookout for that too, and that's coming very soon. Um, all the content is done, so we'll talk about that. We uh, have one from Ryan, big guy here. Uh, Ryan asks, uh, do we have faith that invasive BCI tech can be production uh, product product productized? Um, Put into production. I'll just say. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime in, in the near future, uh, Gabe Newell seems to think that it can be. Uh, I think that the biggest uh, hurdle that invasive BCIs will need to overcome is the societal hurdles. Um, so that's, you know, getting people, um, making it normal for people to have them. Uh, I think that once that happens, um, we'll definitely see um, a lot of, of, of progression towards um, getting everybody brain implants. But until that happens, I think non-invasive neurotechnology is still going to be uh, reigning su supreme in the, in, the short, in the short term. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that in terms of a general consumer device, for sure. Um, because you always have in neurotech or brain computer interfaces specifically this balance of okay, like what is the value to cost ratio, right? And that's true in, in any product, but it's really obvious in Neurotech because if you're asking someone to get brain surgery, it better be pretty freaking useful for their yeah. life, right? To be able to do something like that. Mm -hmm. However, in terms of producing something um, commercially, in the medical space, there's a lot of stuff that already that already is. So again, neuromodulation, things that are helping to fix part of your nervous system that, that may have been broken. There are lots of technologies. Cochlear implants is a great example. Um, deep brain stimulation, helping out with stuff like Parkinson's and, and other other stuff, um, also um, you know put into production, and even stuff like stuff like Neuralink and stuff that that's a little bit newer still has potential in people that can get more benefit out of it, like someone with a, a motor disability. Um, but in terms of in the future, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so Tristan Campbell here asks, how easily do you think that the average person can write programs using BCIs, uh, more so in terms of invasive BCIs like Neuralink? 
Um, so my my personal specialty right now is more towards the non-invasive devices, um, like OpenBCI's devices and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I'd love to hear actually Forrest's take on this. So how, how easy, Forrest, do you think it would be for like a, like a normal programmer to come in and make a, uh, some sort of program that works with uh, like a Neuralink? So the Neuralink, I think that's like a harder question to answer because I don't even know if that, that device is fully formed yet. But like we're talking go like for brain it's easier to access BCI, like yeah. the open BCI headset or something. And like Thanks. maybe it might be a little bit easier for someone to pick that up and just start developing something. With. Whether you could develop something that works with it depends on what, how ambitious you are. Like if you're being really unambitious, like you would probably build something with it. But if you're talking like, I want to move individual fingers of my hand in a simulation from an open BCI headset, it might be a little harder to achieve uh, without a little bit more experience. Yeah. You can try. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely I, an informative experience, like trying to do that. So one thing to completely shamelessly self-plug, I would say to go look at video 7.1, lesson 7.1 uh, in the course, we talk about some methods of, of how these are used. And so like we haven't had access to any of these invasive technologies, so we don't know what it's like specifically to program with them. But um, what like one of the things that's particularly relevant to invasive technology is something called population coding. And so this is looking at neurons that pick direction. So if you want to move your arm forward, there's a group of neurons that will tell it to go forward. And so you can pick that up and, and through machine learning, just kind of figure out, okay, they want to move forward, these neurons fire. And so there are, you know, there are plenty of people that do know about that stuff um, that, you know, we'd like to interview and, and talk to in the future. Um, all right, should we, can you guys pay attention to where we are in the chat so we can come back to the questions? I want to keep sure. moving, yep, unless you, okay, yeah. I want to keep moving, we'll come back to questions. Those, those questions. Yeah we'll, yeah, we'll come back to questions here after we get through some of the other um, content that we're looking at, but keep them coming, guys. Yeah. So Colin and anybody else that wants to join in, um, why did we create the course? What was the purpose? Well, for me personally, uh, the biggest problem I had with learning about brain-computer interfaces was, um, all the content around it was really complex. Um, I, I, like, especially as a freshman in college, um, in my undergraduate, I, I had no idea um, where to even begin. Um, like, I had a, I was fortunate enough to, to get a hold of a Open BCI board, uh, but I didn't really know what to do with all the data that was coming into it. Right. Um, so one of the uh, main goals that I personally had with this course was to sort of um, create content that's easily digestible for people who are interested in this subject matter um, and uh, put it all in one place where you can just sort of watch all the videos and just just sit down you know over the course of a couple of days and, and basically learn the basics of brain computer interfacing. Um, so that that personally was was my goal with this. Yeah, I mean, um but in a very similar way. It's just, for me, it's about just getting more people interested in this space. And neurotech is really um, intimidating, I think, because neuroscience itself is very difficult, obviously. Yeah. All of these fields that need to come together are individually difficult. And so we wanted to try to find a way to give people an entry point into the space, whether it's that they want to work in the space or are just curious, without having to like spend years learning how to read and interpret a scientific paper in neurotech. And so that's that continues to be our mission and, and what we want to do. And that's why we created this course. You can go through this and have a pretty decent idea about neurotechnology, a very broad overview of neurotechnology um, through just doing this. And um, I'm really happy with where we landed on that. Do you have anybody else have anything they want to say or move on? Move on. All right. Um, so let's see, what, uh, what was favorite and least favorite part of, of making the course? And then what would be favorite and least favorite video? So we'll start Ooh. with, <laughs> I'm going to start at the bottom if it's okay. And I'm going to go to Michael Forrest and then Colin. Is that all right? Nice. Okay. <laughs> so this is where I slam the whole series. <laughs> there was no favorite part. Um, no, but I had like a serious answer and a jokey answer. Go so like the both. serious yeah. answer was, um, I really like that, that this close knit team dynamic we had. Yeah. It's the first time I had that where it's just, everything was in order, pass off, do that, complete. And then the Trello board that I kept forgetting, <laughs> but, um, everything was so organized and it flowed, it just worked out so well. And that like helped fuel the creative process. Cause I'm not like, should I do this? I mean, I could, but I don't know. 
it, it helped a lot and it, it felt good. No, and then the jokey answer is that my favorite part was finding all the, the YouTube bits to yes. make in the episode. <laughs> like any excuse to just make it like um, go off the deep end. That was pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, your personality really came through in a lot of those in a lot of those videos, and and it has been really fun working with you guys through all of the stress of different deadlines and figuring out how we're doing stuff. Because when we and I, I do want to mention too that we had a a larger team as well. This was just like you know like these guys really put in a ton of time. This was the core team, but we had a lot of people volunteering as well. You can see those credits at the end of every video. Um, but I want to stress like in the beginning of this. We were we knew stuff about neurotech, but we knew nothing about like video production and, and all of this stuff and what putting together a course would look like and all that. And so it was really a good learning experience where we I think all had to be patient with each other as well as we were learning things and figuring stuff out and, and that was really good. Uh, sorry to jump in there. Forrest, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I definitely I would say that, like my favorite part of the course was that it gave me a great opportunity to like really dive into the history. Like that was like probably my favorite part of like going back through and making sure that we had like a comprehensive coverage of a lot of these topics. Because I really wanted to to get a bit of a deeper understanding about like how did all these things come about. I really felt like this helped to refresh my memory on a lot of things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you're gonna teach something, you've gotta you know. Like for, for us anyway, the amount of like papers that we read and referenced and textbook pages mm -hmm. and stuff to be able to make, you know, it's like 20 to one for what you end up making. And that was, <laughs> that was a really good experience. Yeah, Colin, go ahead. Um, well, my, my favorite memory um, from the whole recording process was scamming Best Buy. Um, oh no! So, <laughs> so um, no. we had we had this uh, we had this this moment where we realized we didn't have a 4K camera uh, available. We had thought that we were going to be able to to rent a camera from somebody that we knew. Um, so, yeah, uh, in order to that. solve that solve that problem, um, we went to Best Buy and we bought a uh, a, a brand new 4K camera. Uh, we used it to record the entire series. Uh, and then we returned it at the end of the recording of the series. Uh, so we had to actually condense our recording time down much quicker <laughs> than what we had planned because we had to get that camera back and we were worried about all that. But it was that was a, a funny little tidbit. We saw the pay money for basically a yeah, rental fee. Which to Best Buy made us feel um, better. Yeah, yeah so yeah, that definitely. was that was not that was not <laughs> the plan of what we were going to do. We had actually uh, hired a production company to help us out. And there were a lot of issues uh, working with them and a lot of last minute headaches that we were not that we were not aware of. And they ended up just kind of walking away in the day that we were there for a set. So we had to figure some stuff out. But that goes to kind of what uh, Michael was saying before. Um, and it's just that like, we problem solved very well and we figured it out and that was and like that was honestly like my favorite part is like at that point and then also there were so many parts where we didn't like know what the next step should be and we we took a shot and we worked it through and you know we had no idea what this would look like in the end and i'm yeah. really happy with what everyone was able to put together because that was yeah. that was really exciting and, and, the other, and building off of that just hitting yeah. our groove just was so yeah. awesome yeah. like like sort of what mike said earlier was, yeah. it's just it was it was phenomenal to sort of feel it all click into place uh after all the effort yeah. and stuff that we took and now through that learning process like we are ready to create more content really excited to as well so um, season two season two yes <laughs> we will um but my kind of other favorite part which is like really cheesy so just like be prepared for that um is all the, all the feedback from you wonderful listeners, um, which has really just been like, when we put that out there, we have been working on it for a while. And you when you work on something like that, you kind of get in your own headspace and you have no idea how other people will react to it, if it will be useful at all. And so we have gotten so many wonderful supportive comments from everyone. And I just like, we really appreciate that. That brightens our day when we, when we get stuff like that. Um, and there was one, there's one story in particular that I want to tell. Um, where it was probably about a month and a half ago, uh, a mom had reached out to me and said that uh, her daughters in high school had watched some of our videos. They're really interested in neurotech and she uh, runs like a chapter or something for this innovation challenge, right? So they give you a question or, or a problem that could happen in future society and you have to use a cutting edge technology to fix it. It's theoretical, but you know, you get thinking about it. Um, and so I thought it would just be, you know, um, 
one or two of her daughters, and I was really happy to do that because I love to talk to people about neurotech. And I jumped on, and there were 13 kids from fifth grade to 11th grade. And and I was I was shocked to see that many people. And they and the mom had asked, like, who has seen all of the BCI guys' videos? And all but one person raised their hand, and he was like, oh, I'm, I'm close. I'm on, like, less than seven. I was like, don't worry about it. That is amazing. That is amazing. It's, it's so great to be talking to all of you. And they had these just such... Like the fifth grader asked the first question, and it was just an incredibly interested and complex question about DBS, where he's asking, like, he's like, okay, so I know it works this way, it goes through the cortex, it goes to the basal ganglia, but then how does it do this thing? And it was just like, wow, like it was really, really amazing to see that they had understood this and taken taken value from it. So that was really uh, a really, really exciting thing for me, anyway. Um, favorite video? We'll do the same order. Favorite uh, video. 2.1, baby. Because that, <laughs> like, our, we're saying it that it hit the groove, like, in the edit. Yeah. And yes. um, just, yes. like, because uh, we filmed that chronologically, right? Like, on the day. Yep. Because, yep. like, I feel like that's when the on-camera cadence, I think that was Colin, his his flow was working a lot better. And it just, mm -hmm. it helped the video so much. And it just felt more natural to edit. So yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> that was my favorite. Forced. Um, definitely gonna go with 2.1. Watching the Luigi Galvani skit was. One of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I, it's funny. I also thought 2.1 was was the best. Uh, I love the the little skits that we did in that one. I I, I think that in the future we're definitely gonna incorporate more of those. Had yeah. we known how amazing those would turn out, I think we would have added <laughs> them in more of the videos. But man, they were just they, they were, were hilarious. Yeah. They were. Oh, yeah, they, they were started. So they started too. with 2.1, right? Yeah, yeah they did. that yeah, was, yeah. and there was really only one other video with skits in it, which was the boxing thing. And I wish too oh, yeah. that we had we were under a tight timeline, and there was a lot of there were a lot of things that were falling in place because of those previous issues. But it would have I wish we took a little bit more time with that stuff and baked in more skits because that was so fun. And yes, that was yeah. um, my favorite video to, to watch for sure. My favorite video to write and make um, was the was seven or eight point two, which was the neurophilosophy one. Um, I didn't realize I would like that one so so much um, because I just I I thought that one was really interesting going into cyborg theory and, and all of that stuff that was just fun to dive into the literature there um, but yeah cool oh one other thing that I'm remembering for just funny memories and if anybody uh, has any other ones jump on is uh, we <laughs> so we thought we'd have a different microphone and so we ended up just having to grab one from Colin's car. Um, that was not the mic that we were expecting to do at all. And so I'm sure many of you have noticed, I've seen some comments about this, but we could not move our left hands through the, through the whole thing. And so we could only use, we are capable, Colin, raise your left hand, we are capable of moving <laughs> these hands. Believe it or not. Um, but, uh, but that was just a very funny thing. And watching it back, it's like, it's so hard to watch yourself. It's like, oh my God, my thumb is just up the whole time. My hand is just not, it looks so weird. Like I think, stuff. yeah, you are the most animated with that hand, just like... It was. I was paddling water the entire time. <laughs> yeah. So, oh my God. yeah. So, but there you go. You learned from it. Um, all right. So, if nobody has anything that they want to add to that, we can jump to the most exciting part. I'm so opinion, excited. Which is ah. Which is the bloopers. So let me let me cue that up here. Um, We've been waiting for these. <laughs> Mike's been waiting for us to see him, I'm sure. Yeah, so <laughs> I've, been, I've been got him up the whole here, time. but <laughs> I haven't watched the video through, and I am a little nervous, but this should be good. Okay, so let me, let me do a screen share left, and now I'm going to share the screen here. Bear with me, everyone. All right. Can, can you guys see Colin Forrest? Michael, you can see my yes. screen here? And it looks like on the stream we've got it working as well. So I'm going to move us up to the corner. Hopefully that won't get in the way. All right, here we go. If you really stop and think about it, the brain is a wild organ. Like not only did it name itself, but the entire field of neuroscience is the brain researching itself. Kind of crazy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. This Some fantastic. studies have shown oh my God. that spending 700 hours editing a single series <laughs> can be very detrimental. You should just put him in front of the camera. Brain. What are we doing? Big picture. <laughs> Let's jump into that brain. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Hi, I'm Colin Canning, and in this video, we are going to discuss all the ways that they <laughs> up. <laughs> Hey kid, want to learn about brains? Well, I don't think the mic is the mic on. Is it on? I don't think, I think we're it's doing on. the mic. mic is on. Yeah, oh, mic's on. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Nobody knows it. Nobody That's the wrong word that I said. <laughs> sorry about that. New system <laughs> of computer control. Oh, sorry. I almost vomited. <laughs> but, but for applications outside of just the MRI uses complex electro electro electro. After starting their, <laughs> could they beam these these of their all Jesus Christ, I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to do this Vsauce time. Oh, but, okay. It? I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. No. Thank you for explaining the script I wrote to myself. I appreciate it. Sorry about that. However, the seizures that caused <laughs> epilepsy. <laughs> 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 I'm having a seizure. Someone please help me. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Awesome. You did it. Yeah, you're right. I'm tired. We're not doing any more. Oh, dude. Holy f We're done already. Jesus. All right. Cool. Keep that in. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Let that me... was absolutely hilarious. <laughs> Stop the show for whatever <laughs> weird YouTube recommendation thing. That was fantastic. Oh my god. That was so fun to make. Like, oh my god. I'm so literally not. crying. <laughs> that was so funny. Oh, that was wonderful. I, I think Mike should just be the next BCI guy. I think we can, <laughs> when we retire, we'll just toss it to you. Or maybe now. It won't be more yeah. interesting. I love it. I'm done. I'm watching that video on repeat after the stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. That was awesome. Uh, also, that nightmare, the the nightmare intro for the the logo. That was. Yeah. How did you do that? And how did you do the Colin Canning thing? Because I didn't. <laughs> how did you do it? It's, it took a while. I had to like merge and crop the different yeah. this, this, both the name tags, and then I had to dig into the downloads for where you found the the intro for all the lessons, and then yeah. go and customize wow. the. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was necessary though. We had to do. Yeah. That. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean. And good for you doing it. Because so I made those in After Effects with templates, but I did those in yeah. After Effects with templates. And so I am amazed that you were able to just like <laughs> pull those together. That's so much more work, but I'm glad you didn't ask me <laughs> as a surprise. Well, Michael is the That's maestro awesome. of the video. He editing, is. So. Yeah, he is. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. That's amazing. Oh my God, that was so funny. All right, well, let's <laughs> let's take a couple more questions because then we're going to get into asking the audience questions so that they can get a chance to win some merch. Sure. So Computing Brain asks, how do you guys keep up to date with the latest advances in neurotech? I swear there's a new paper every single day. Yes. Yes, there is a new paper every single day. Um, one way that we do it is uh, through like Google Alerts. We have all of them uh, sent to a different email. That's useful. Uh, and then honestly, like one of the best things that you can do regardless of career is just like spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. And so we do that and we just get papers kind of thrown at us for that. So. Actually, Harrison, on that note, I have a comment to bridge off from that. Specifically Please. on LinkedIn, if you connect with or if you're following some of the major names in neurotechnology, a lot of times they will post documents related to what's going on in the space of translation of these technologies into actual use. Yep. So like, I think it was like a few years ago, I saw someone posted like the in progress, like FDA, like neurotechnology guidelines. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, interesting. Yeah. So I was like, that, that's kind of cool, right? It's like, if you're paying attention to what's going on on LinkedIn, you can really kind of get an insight into how the field is progressing. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a that's a great point. Just follow people that are prominent in the space. There are some people that do like neurotech communications and we're doing that as well. So we'll try to keep you updated, but, and also, yeah, like my feed, I'm constantly resharing stuff, but social media is great like that as long as you, you know, find the right hashtags, right people, stuff like that. 
So we have a familiar face with the next question, uh, Leo Farisi, <laughs> who helped us hey. out with some of the written content. Yeah. Um, Leo asks, which of you guys would get an invasive neural implant and why? I think I would get one eventually, not right off. I don't want to be one of the beta testers <laughs> of, of a brain, of like an implantable brain computer interface. But um, once they got all the kinks worked out, I would love to have something that sort of like drew over my reality, like had like an augmented reality type deal. I think that'd be really cool. Ooh. Yeah, definitely 2.0. We yeah. hop on a 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 2.0 is the experience on... of just getting an implant. Go ahead. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead. I, I think it, it depends on like where they're implanting it, what technology it is, and whether I understand it. I, I like mm. to like, when I get a product, I like to understand how the product works. So like if they tell me like, oh, I want to stick like a micro electrode array in my arm, I'm like, I don't know how I feel about that. But like, if they tell me they're just going to wrap it around, I'm like, okay, you better try it. Not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Michael, what do you got? Would you get a brain implant? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, if it, I mean, price and then if ease, uh, would it like sync to my phone? Or, like, yeah, what is it? it what does it yeah. have to do? I think I think that's a, a good modification. Of the question is, what would an what would a implant have to do for you to get it? Because would I get an implant now? No, absolutely. You know, it's, it doesn't really do enough. But in the future, definitely. So what would it have to do for you to get one? Memory storage, like you could. Ooh, that's a good one. Store like things that you think you'll forget, and then, like that freaking Black Mirror, right? That's what the or when they yep. have the eye and he's like going it's back the into the. Yeah, 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 that thing. All right, I got a hard one here. Uh, Maria Root asks, what provability is there to agree the brain functions that control the equilibrio with an IMU device that regulates the dysfunctions of the balance? So, um, right, where is that one? Level... I need to see that in written. <laughs> <laughs> what, so what level of, um, academic, um, uh, provability, I guess, um, is there to say that, that, uh, the brain functions that control the equilibrio with an IMU device? Um, which regulates dysfunctions of balance. So like how so accurate are studies that, that yeah. use IMU? Yeah, so this is, so I, I assume that we're talking about vestibular implants here. And so these are usually, and correct me if I'm wrong in the, in the chat, but these are usually um, modifications onto cochlear implants. And the reason why they do that is because uh, cochlear implants are already FDA approved. And so usually what they do is they'll take a couple electrodes and they'll put it into um, part of your vestibular system. And so I will try to keep this brief, but there are two parts of your vestibular system. You have the semicircular canals, which detect rotational movement like this. So there are these big swooping, like, uh, you know, it looks like this, it looks like a tunnel, right? Um, and then you have um, this other part uh, that has these, that detects basically forward and backwards. Um, so this is your, they have otolith in them. Um, and that's not important though. So basically what they try to do is stimulate uh, each of these. So there are three semicircular canals and they try to stimulate those and they try to stimulate the otolith organs as well. And that does work, but the problem is that you have a very complex thing. So you have fluid moving through this space and trying to stimulate that through electrical stimulation is really hard. And it's actually harder than hearing because hearing is linear in terms of uh, in terms of frequencies. And the other piece that makes it very difficult is if you could hear out of one ear, you can still hear, right? You lose a little bit of ability, but you can still hear. The other thing is for the stimulator system to work, you need a combination of both. So when one is going forward, you have to have a negative effect on the other one. And so there are studies that have shown that this works, but usually what I've seen is about 50% of the time it has some benefit, and then other times it can actually have a detriment because it's really hard to figure out to use an accelerometer and then have that latency try to correlate to electrical stimulation. Hopefully that that answered your question. If you send an email to the VCI guys dot, uh, the VCI guys at gmail.com, I'm happy to try to expand upon that, especially if I didn't answer the question. But do we have any others? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, from Maria, what kind of main training is necessary to find a job in, in brain computer interfacing? That's MATLAB, Python, C, signal processing. Um, I would say just having a broad understanding of data science, filtering, different, different filtering algorithms, that sort of thing um, will help the most. Signal processing is, is a big part of brain computer interfacing. Um, and, it, you know, understanding the basics of things like Fourier transformations and, um, 
and you, like band stops, things like that, uh, will help tremendously um, in understanding brain data that come, that that uh, that you're getting from these raw devices. Forrest will probably have a opinion on this as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been saying a little bit of stuff in the chat, but um, my basic understanding is like, if you want to be in the field as a physician, it'd be a very different story from if you wanted to be in the field as a computer scientist, from if you wanted to be an electrical engineer or a neuroscientist. There are a right. lot of different things that each of those people can do that others in the other fields may have some difficulty doing without additional training. So like me coming in as like a biomedical electrical engineer, if I want to start working with animals, I need to go through a whole bunch of training to get an understanding about how that even works and like what are the behaviors I need to be looking for and all that stuff. Whereas someone who came in trained with like understanding of these animals may already know what to look for and they may not have to go through all these processes versus someone who's a physician in this space may not want to be working on the technology and developing new ones. Maybe they just want to test it clinically with a patient or with an animal subject or so on and so forth. So there are a lot of different aspects to this like field of BCIs and neurotechnology. You have to figure out what part of it you want to work on. Um, but if I was to say what was the most important skill to have is an understanding of how the physiology of the neural system you want to work with works and understanding what tools exist already to work with those systems. Yes. If you understand broadly how to work with those two things, I think you can figure out the next steps for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the key theme there is that it depends on specialization and what you're going to do, right? Because neurotechnology is a new field and you could do, you could have really any background and find something in it, like even de like design, you need that for certain aspects of the product, right? But the most applicable ones are usually, I would say neuroscience, biomed, software engineering, electrical engineering, probably within those areas. And yeah, each of those are gonna have their own specializations. Um, and you know, if you're applying to a lab, they'll have specific things. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's probably. Yeah, probably another fun. thing, also, Harrison, off of what you said with design, is that yeah. you also have to think about the fact that sometimes for some of these devices, there are external components. Mm. So you have to think about how the patient feels about other people seeing them wearing this technology, like for a prosthetic limb, yep. right? Like when someone sees them wearing like a robotic prosthesis, how do you think the person feels when they see everyone looking at them with their prosthesis, right? Like maybe you want to make the prosthesis look more human, or maybe you want them to make it explicitly look like an Iron Man hand. Maybe that makes it look cooler and they feel yeah. more proud of it. Like you have to talk to these patients to get an understanding of, of what their perspective is and what they're actually looking for in these devices. Yeah, no, that's that's a huge uh, point that people uh, don't think about uh, a lot of the time. And so we were actually talking with Ryan from Neuropod. So Neuropod is another YouTube channel that has a lot of great coverage on Neuralink. I think I actually saw him floating around the chat. So definitely, definitely go check him out. Um, but they do like news videos on uh, Neuralink. But one of the biggest issues that we're going to have to overcome with non-invasive devices is making them having a sort of a cultural shift where we're okay with seeing these devices or hiding them. We actually did some, um, we, we ran some surveys and spoke to some people with ALS, muscular dystrophy, and cerebral palsy. And this was a very consistent concern that they had was what does this look like? How, which is interesting, which was very interesting to me because they're already in a wheelchair. So there is already a visual difference. But the, the form factor of the headset was a concern. So it's something that we have to think about. But Another thing anyway. also that affects those people that maybe isn't even internally psychological of an issue mm. is the sense that like how other people perceive them. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uncanny valley, but like yeah. the more components, I mean, I guess we'll talk about this later if we talk about some yeah. high boards, but yeah, you know, let's, you know, you have to think about that a little bit in that process yeah. as well. I'm looking at the time. I see that we're, that we're, um, that it's, got it's about running late a little minutes bit. here. No, no, no. We're gonna we're, we'll go past that, but we've got to. <laughs> I want to make sure that we get through this, so that we're not keeping people on forever. Do we have any other like big questions here? Because we're gonna need to monitor the chat for people's answers. So, is there anything else that we want to address? Maybe rapid just, fire. Rapid fire. Uh, I, no, there's no other questions. Uh, just keep them coming, guys. Sure? If you have any more questions, uh, put them in chat. Um, yeah. Keep oh them yeah, coming. Forrest has been on top of it. Perfect. Yeah, I've been helping. Um, you. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So now we are going to do. Uh, I see a ghost running behind the call. <laughs> now we're going to do the audience questions. So we're going to quiz you guys. Uh, let's see. Is it that one? Yes, it's that one. So we're going to quiz you guys, and you have the opportunity to win some merch. We'll get in touch with you after, um, and yeah, and we'll send you some stuff. So this is just a sticker. This is the first three questions. If you get them, correct first person to put the correct answer in the chat um, 
first person to get the correct answer in the chat gets the uh, gets the sticker. So um, can you guys help monitor and just figure out whoever the first person is and announce it? Yep, I got it. So the first question is, what lobe of the brain is highlighted? What are we looking at here? And there's a little bit of a hint by saying that it is a lobe, so you got a one in four shot. We have a. I see oh, some I answers. Was, I didn't see I was who muted. was first. Parietal lobe. Maria got it first. Hey. Awesome. Congratulations, Maria. Send us a DM on Instagram or on uh, YouTube, and we will get you that uh, yeah, sticker shipped out to you. That. Yep. Thank you. All right. They're going to get a little a little harder from here. I do see that there's some questions interlaid in there, so if somebody can pay attention to those, yep, we can I go got back it. to them. That would be great. Um, okay. Uh, next question is, what are the hills and valleys called in the brain? If you remember, we said the brain is very wrinkly, helps give us more surface area. So what is the blue and what is the red? Hills and valleys of the brain. Do, do, do. <laughs> I know, I should have I gotten some Jeopardy music. John first. Hacker, Salsi and Gyrus, correct. Yes, nice. very good, very good. John, make sure you send us a DM either on Facebook or either on uh, YouTube or on Instagram, and we'll get you those merch. John, merch. I got you. Just text me. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, apparently you know him. So. <laughs> I, know, I know John, but he was not given the answers ahead of time. Um, <laughs> All right, this one, getting a little bit harder. This is an MEG. How do you spell MEG? What is this, what is this, stand, what is this stand for overall? This is, this is a tough one. It feels like a power move when you can type this correctly, though. All of these <laughs> random things. It's like, wow, I've been doing this too long. Yeah, electroencephalography so. was big for me. Yes. Do we have any, any spelling in there? Not, not quite yet. Not yet. I'm watching. And that's M-E-G is the acronym. Yes. What's the M-E-G do? Oh. oh. Uh, All right. Maria. Maria got it, but she already she already won. So we're going to. Well, I guess she gets two. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to? Well, I think get... it's the sticker. So if she wins another thing after, we can we can send the other thing. The so stickers. it's Maria we'll and send, Leo. Yeah. We'll send the sticker. <laughs> um, all right, all right, all right. Next one. This one's this one's for a mug. This one's for a mug. So everybody's eligible again. Uh, what is the question? Let me remember what I'm asking. Okay, yeah, yeah. So in our favorite lesson, collectively lesson two point one, the history lesson, Colin is impersonating uh, someone who discovered bioelectricity. Who is that person? Who is he impersonating as he stabs this poor, poor little rubber frog? There's a pretty big hint on the screen there. <laughs> uh, Leo wins the mug with Luigi Galvani. Oh, message was re retracted. Oh, he retracted it, though. Oh! Uh-oh. I don't know what we do. <laughs> but somebody yeah, said I Galvani. Think it was spelled I think, correctly. I think... <laughs> All right, well, Leo, you're on the team. We'll... We'll send you something, we'll but send we'll give it to Computing Brain. We'll give it to Computing, computing Brain. Computing Brain gets, gets the mug. Congrats, Computing Brain. Uh. <laughs> All right, we got one more for a T-shirt. Standard issue BCI guys T-shirt. Become part of the team. Uh, so in Lesson 4.2, we presented a theory of neural communication and processing from a well-known study that proclaimed that they had found a neuron that fired whenever the participants saw this famous actress. Who is the actress? I should know this one, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, this one's definitely a little harder because this one, you have to, uh, you really couldn't just have general neuroscience knowledge unless you saw that. Who was the actress? Classic uh, story for neuroscience right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Leo did help yeah. write that. Ryan Big Guy with Jennifer Aniston. That's Congrats, hilarious. Ryan Big Guy. Very close, Tristan. Ryan Big Guy. Nice. 
Awesome. Okay, uh, real question though for all the marbles. Uh, Friends or The Office? Friends or The Office? The Office for sure. No, I'm yeah. sorry. The answer was please stop putting this in your Tinder bio. That was actually the answer <laughs> to that question. Um, okay. Uh, I have some more questions here if, if you want to get those out of the way real quick. Oh, sure. But okay. Yeah, that was for the, the awards and stuff. But if you want to ask more questions, yeah, go for it. Oh, oh, questions from people yes. in the audience. Yes. Can I win a sticker? Does, can I win a sticker? <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back to our main screen. Go for it. Yeah, hit us with some questions. All right, Ryan Big Guy asks, uh, what right, are your winner. thoughts on, yeah, <laughs> what are your thoughts on read-only BCI tech being integrated into the next generation of VR headsets? Ryan, mm. I think that that is very, very uh, likely to happen, and I think that it's, it's actually already happening. So OpenBCI uh, recently partnered with uh, Valve to create a uh, VR attachment for their for the Valve Index. Um, so I think we're very much likely to see um, that take off in the in the next five to ten years. Uh, I'm excited to see the future of that as well. Yeah, um, I, I think that that's a really really great first use case for non-invasive neurotech because you already have something that affords putting these devices in, right? So you have a you have a headset on your head already, you can just stick electrodes in there. And there are some things that, that we can do. So there are some companies, there's another one called Nextmind, I think Cog Cognixon or Cognixon or something. I don't quite know how to say it. Cognionics, cool, you're talking about? Cognionics, thank you. Yeah, they're making a cool um, VR, AR headset. Um, but yeah, I think this is really cool. And we could see some SSVP applications. Nextmind is already doing that. And then ideally, some motor imagery ones would be cool as well. But yeah, um, very cool. Sorry, I should probably answer these questions sooner. So I'll just show uh, Gianluca Cos uh, Cosentino asks, uh, what do you think about Neuralink for spinal cord injuries? How, ma how many times, uh, how long do you think it would take to solve paralysis with a Neuralink? It's a good question. Um, I, think, I think Neuralink is probably one of the first invasive brain computer interfaces that will help with that sort of thing. Uh, we've already seen BrainGate make some pretty significant strides with moving robotic prostheses um, with their with their invasive system. Um, but I think that 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 the methods that Neuralink uses uh, for like with the flexible electrodes and stuff are, are going to revolutionize invasive brain computer interfacing. And I think that uh, one of those revolutions will definitely come uh, with 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 you know, helping with paralysis. Mm. Yeah, I, one thing I have yeah, a little bit of a concern about with regards to that is that if you're putting the implant in the brain, you know, it, it's not on its own going to be able to solve the problem right. of paralysis with like spinal cord injury because, you know, you have like a break in the connection, right? It's like you, you severed the wires. So like, what do you do then? Well, there are a couple of options, right? Like, I don't know, for those of you who've watched some of the videos already or who may be more familiar with some of the literature, you know, we've talked a little bit about like exoskeletons is another option. And there's plenty of people researching the use of brain computer interfaces for this kind of technology. So in theory, you could use a Neuralink maybe to do something like that. Um, there, yeah. There's a person at, um, at Case Western, or sorry, no, not Case Western, um, Carnegie Mellon, uh, who's currently working on non-invasive EEG based control with really, really high resolution EEG to control a hand in a simulation and move it around. So, I mean, in theory, we, we could potentially easily do this one day. The, the Walk Again Project 2 is a good example. Miguel Nicolelis, yep. who we fanboyed for a couple of times in our course. That's the one uh, I was referencing. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, cool, cool, cool. So, he did something called the Walk Again Project, which you can look into. In terms of, like, healing the spinal cord and, and stuff like that, um, or circumventing it, I think would, would be a better thing. So Neuralink has been focused entirely on the brain. I think that they're gonna stay up there and they would go for a solution where we're controlling a robotic arm or a robotic suit, right? But there have been there are there are plenty of researchers that are working on basically making a wire that connects uh, one part of the nervous system to another. And so if you were able to get it fast enough within the central nervous system, you could probably connect it. Although the problem is when neurons die or get severed or something in the central nervous system, they usually just die. In the peripheral nervous system, though, they can grow back. And so there's a lot of research that tries to connect per lower peripheral nervous system uh, areas. Let's say you have, uh, you've cut the spinal cord like halfway down your back, so you can't access your legs, right? Um, you can try to 
take the signals from the peripheral nervous system down there and route it up higher and connect it in. And there is some research to suggest that that works. Um, and you can also still stimulate the parts of the spinal cord that are working um, in correlation to signals coming from the brain. Um, yeah. There's a really One cool paper with there. cats that, that that worked. I can send you that in an email right. if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I was going to say, the one issue you have with that is that the further up the spinal cord you go, and the further up also like any of the nerves that you go, the more mm -hmm. complex and intertwined the different fibers become. Yeah. So you run into this problem of being able to selectively activate the fibers that you want to activate will record right. from just the fibers you want to record from. Right. And this is a problem with all sorts of types of neural interfaces. It's just different degrees of difficulty depending upon the kind you use. But it's just you know interesting to me you know, when we were like trying to move from an area of like very specific and very small to like much less specific right. and like all in one place, like how do we, how do we map those properly? I think that's a very difficult problem that many people are still working on. Yeah, no, abs it, it absolutely is. Um, so I think maybe a, a, to try to wrap this up, because um, I think we have to be a little faster with these questions. It's my bad. But um, there's, I think a, a good potential solution would be to take signals from the brain and try to reroute them into the lower spinal cord below the lesion. Um, I can send you a paper again where they did this thing where they severed the spinal cords of cats and they were still able to get it to walk by stimulating um, neurons that produce gait. Um, so you stimulate this part and then their back legs walk and it was in correspondence to their, to their brain, so it's, which is very cool. So I don't know if Neuralink will, but it will be possible. All right, next question. We got to speed uh, that, this up, it. rapid fire. That's it for oh, okay, questions. Good. So uh, do you want to get into talking about the actual Neurotech EDU platform, which is hopefully going to be live here soon? Yes, it is on the screen. So we are very, very excited. This uh, course, we have been we were talking with Neurotech X for a long time about doing something like this, because they've been interested in, in educating um, educating people as well, and just really all things neurotech, growing up, making more more neurotechnologists, which is really, really wonderful, and a mission that we've always loved and supported. And so we were talking to them uh, about producing content like for them working within NeurotechX for a while, and we ended up in August deciding to, we wanted to go the route with the BCI guys, and so they uh, started working on this really wonderful platform to be able to put in uh, lots of lots of different content, and so we produce this as the first course as a test pilot. But basically, if you've ever used edX before, it's very similar to that. So we have the videos, and now we have a bunch of written content, other videos thrown in, uh, questions, discussion posts. So um, that is all ready to go, um, and Neurotech X will decide when they're ready to launch that. But we're really excited to have been able to work with them uh, through this, and. Uh, and yeah, you've got a lot more content to come if you're interested in like really diving into it. So yeah, a lot of written content will be released on that. So yeah, um, and they plan on having more courses up there. And so this is all free. Our YouTube course will always stay free. It's free on that platform as well. Um, but I know that they have a lot more courses coming in uh, that will be coming in the next couple of years, and we'll promote those and keep an eye out for it as well. Um, what is our next order of business here? Oh, we are Neurotech. I'm going to talk about this very quickly. So we have a lot of larger projects as well as just the project videos that are that are looming. Um, but one of them, our next one, is we are Neurotech. So the idea behind this is we want to be able to show a diverse view of, of the field of neurotechnology and get the input from people who might be researchers, entrepreneurs, students, or even enthusiasts with demonstrated interest. And so we will have certain questions. Um, so this looks like a, a Zoom call. This is a mock-up of what it could look like. But we're going to build a website that looks like a video call. Um, but at the top, there will be a question. And the question will be something like, um, what is the most exciting future application of Neurotech? Or to our question earlier, would you get a brain implant? And then we have people from all these different areas provide a 90 second to two minute answer and you can scroll over each one and click on them or have them like autoplay through to uh, to learn what people think about it. And so um, again, if, if this is something you'd be interested in, in helping out, submitting a couple videos, uh, again, please email us at thebciguys uh, at gmail.com. So yeah, and then that's just what it'll look like there. Okay, so that was just a quick thing on that next project, um, and we'll have some more information to come about that. But we have some more questions for us to answer, and we also want to hear your answers as well. So what is the most exciting future application of neurotechnology? Come, we'll start with you this time, and then cycle through Forrest, and then Michael. And then I guess I'll go with you. 
so for future applications, I, I, th I, I think that augmented reality and virtual reality will um, reign supreme with brain computer interfaces, at least from a um, consumer standpoint. Um, I, I think that that's where the most obvious use case is in terms of controlling systems without having to actually touch a keyboard or a mouse or a touch screen or anything like that. Um, and I think that um, you know, virtual reality is going to come a long right way over the next 50 years. Uh, so I'm excited to see um, the progress there. Forrest, go for it. All righty. So in my experience, I think we're a little ways away still from this. But I would, I would say probably the most exciting thing to me in the future of neurotechnology is the day that people with disabilities are able to do even more than they would have been able to do before they either lost that function or, or for some people, maybe they may not have had it at all. Um, so like I imagine a future where maybe like one day a person who has lost the ability to feel somewhere might be able to feel things that no ordinary person would be able to feel. Mm. Mm. I think that's like the most exciting thing to me about the future is like being yeah. able to make it possible to do that. That, yeah, that's pretty similar to my answer too. It's so freaking cool. Michael, what do you got? Um, as a video guy, mine is the neural VR, like it was mentioned earlier, but um, from like an entertainment standby, like ba even back to Black Mirror, that, that like interactive episode they had, if they had like the, you could, it could, the episode could interact with you as you're watching it and like just read, take you down the different paths that you're thinking, yeah. that'd be like next level. I yeah, think. seriously. Ah, it's all. I wish my answer could be all of those. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I always go back to this idea of making technology more human, and so a large part of that is making data have senses associated with it, have emotion associated uh, associated with it. So remove the two dimensional screen, walk around in three D, and feel data, experience data, um, and you know, like we were talking about this again earlier with with Ryan from from Neuropod. Um, like this to me is just about like it's expanding consciousness or capabilities and, and that's really exciting. It's like the next leap in, in human uh, evolution. And actually um, on, the, on, on that note kind of with Neuropod, I see that Ryan commented that Neuralink will also work on developing a neural shunt to bridge the connection with a wireless communication from the brain to a specific limb, which I did not know. So, um, so I just wanted to put that out there based on the last question. Um, I'm sure he'll have a video about that, but that's something we'll look into as well. All right, rapid fire here. Most exciting current application of Neurotech. Oh boy, I think that the accessibility part is the, the biggest part for me. Um, so, you know, having, uh, for example, the, the, the brain handwriting video that we just covered, um, where uh, with the brain gate systems, they're able to actually um, pick up somebody's handwriting as they're pretending to handwrite, just despite the fact that they can't move their arm anymore. Um, so I, I think that accessibility in general is is currently the best use case for, for neurotechnology. And I think that'll be the case for some time. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it, Forrest. I love the mic, by the way. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I find it hard to give a really strong answer to like the current best application, because there's so much like really interesting and cool stuff going on. And given the different hats I have my hands in, it makes it difficult for me to pick between them. Mm -hmm. But if I had to pick one thing that I think is like super cool that like came out of some of like the more recent research, um, for anyone who hasn't heard of it, targeted muscle re where like a person who maybe lost their limb, that you can take the nerve and you can pull it up through the arm and then re-implant it on the chest. And in doing so, you can then actually record from the different sites from that and then use that to control a prosthesis mm -hmm. and move it. And, and people are already doing this. Not only that, but phantom pain in those patients goes almost completely away. It's, it's like mind blowing the amount yeah. that you can achieve by just moving this nerve to a new location, re it, and sticking electrodes there to record from them. It, it's, it's amazing to me that yeah. you can do so much for a patient with just that. It really is. Yeah, for sure. I had something that came across, I'm pretty overwhelmed, but like something that came across my Reddit feed naturally was this, um, it was this John Hopkins research thing last year where they, you could fact check me on this, but the ventral pallid, pallidum neurons, ventral pallidum neurons, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And they were yeah. they were manipulating those to um like I uh, um change the rat's taste in water if that oh, like they cool. preferred the sugary water but they could change mm -hmm. that and so that they would think that the the unflavored water was better. And hmm. they, they were talking about that from like a dieting angle and like changing the whole food um yeah. fitness industry for like we could all just be drinking soylent. Um, <laughs> that's so, that's 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 a great point. That's cool. Yeah. I that was cool. That. And and it came out, I think it was like November last year, and it was in my Reddit saved. So cool. And maybe we could do something about the um I don't know, like the the food problem we have in the United States right now. Yeah. We, we make it yeah. so that people will eat healthier foods. Yeah. Make uh vegetables taste like cotton candy. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Um was that the was that the right neuron? The palate? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the right name, I think. I don't, yeah, I, you, I think you said it correctly. I'm okay. not familiar with that study, but but yeah, that seems right. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the study either. I haven't been reading about it because I've been mostly focused on touch perception, such like that. That's been my focus the past year. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really cool. Uh, for me, I think for like right now application, it's neuromodulation stuff. So that's whether it's invasive or non-invasive. I think ultrasound is really cool for non-invasive, but just the ability that the abilities that we already have right now to cut down on chronic pain when so many people suffer from, from chronic pain, I think that's huge. Mental health things are huge. Helping with Parkinson's, like these devices have a demonstrated real uh, impact on people's lives. So I think that that's exciting. Do we have any answers from the audience? So I see for the last one, gaming and human augmentation, VR. Yep, so everybody agrees with that, Colin. Um, and John Hacker says probably the start of human augmentation with the neurostimulation technologies, though. So yeah, yeah human augmentation. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Cognitive enhancements. Yeah, that's going to be really cool. You also really got to think about the patient experience there too, because we're we're still working on a lot of the kinks out of that. Even cochlear implants, which are one of the most successful neural implant devices, have issues in the sense of like recognizing a person's tone of voice from like one person to another person if they sound too similar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We've got a long way to come for sure. All right. So our last question here, I think. No, well, our last one of these questions anyway is what is a cyborg? And I really encourage people to offer their own definitions in the chat because, again, in, in looking through cyborg theory and stuff, it's just so interesting how many ways it can be interpreted. So what is a cyborg? Um, Colin, go for it if you can. I think a cyborg is anything that or any human being that integrates technology uh, into their everyday life. Um, so that's things such as, uh, I mean, honestly, I think most people are cyborgs today. And this is an interesting philosophical question uh, that a lot of people have nowadays. Yeah. Uh, we're all pretty much reliant on our smartphones or on our other technology. Um, so I think that that is the very base level cyborg. And I think that as time goes on, obviously that's going to expand into uh, neural interfaces and uh, augmentations and, and that sort of thing. Cool. Cool. Forrest? Um, I would have to say I would define a cyborg as being anyone who has some degree of modification to them, which either extends function or restores function in some way. Hmm. That's my personal definition of it. Yeah. But I, I think it's different from what one would define as an android in the sense that like a cyborg originated as an, an a living organism versus you have an android which originates as a machine. So you could have an android right. with biological tissue, but I would not call that a cyborg. Gotcha. I would call that an android. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So does, does technology have to be physically connected to be a cyborg to a human or, or is there a mental connection or no? Mm. I'm not really sure on that one. I, have, I don't have an answer to that yet. But I, I think it's hard to argue that someone being connected to some piece of technology that's outside of them, if it's really become like a personal component of their own life experience, mm -hmm. whether that's really separate from them. That's a very difficult question yeah. to answer. Yeah, like, like when a I person think wears a cell phone, this yeah. is mine. Right, right, right absolutely. Like, I have a question for you then based on that, right? It's like if someone were to damage someone's prosthesis, is that the same as like, hitting them or is that damaging property? This is an interesting question. It is. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I have a thought on that, but I want to go, go to Michael first. 
Oh, I've got the pretty base level. It's like, I think it's the perfect cocktail. Like you can't go either way. You can't be full, ro it would have to be. Yeah. So they've got um, a RoboCop basically. Yeah. 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 yeah and, that's... Then, and then you can play with the whole movie thing where they're just like, I don't know if I'm human or robot. And it's just the, the whole dilemma there. Yes, yeah, so you like a good narrative around your yeah. your cyborgs. Absolutely. Well, you're the that's you're the video all. editor. You're a movie guy, so that's, that's all sense. I care about. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, it's it's true. It would be really boring if we defined cyborgs as someone with a cell phone, and then that was a movie about a cyborg and just a person with a cell phone. But um, but yeah, so my my definition of cyborg, my original one was really just like any time a human is interacting with technology, because I was looking at the brain and watching how we get, we, we start to understand, like if someone's using a hammer, you start to be able to understand where that hammer is in space to be able to hit the nail. And so your, mm -hmm. your brain is adapting that into your, into your um, mental model of yourself to be able to do that. And so in a sense, it's becoming, it's becoming a part of you. But because the cyber part says it's like, comes from cybernetic and it needs to be like an electronic device or something like that, I will modify that to say, when we use any type of electronic device um, in a way that's like somewhat personal. So a smartphone using a computer um, because we are taking memories, we're storing them in the computer, we're, you know, we're using it to augment a part of ourselves. And so I think that that's definitely um, makes us a cyborg. The other thing too, and I'll just wrap up with this quickly, is uh, people that have prosthetics, this is responding to you for us, people that, that have prosthetics or are in a wheelchair generally after a couple years or sooner, they start to have dreams where they see that prosthetic arm or they see themselves in a wheelchair. Um, and so it's interesting because we see like quite, quite obviously through that, that the brain has now adapted this, okay, I like this wheelchair is a part of me, this prosthetic is a part of me now. Well, and so, Harrison, to counter yeah. you, I actually have an additional comment. Please. A large percentage of amputees will abandon their prosthetics in their lifetime. Mm. So, you know, if you look at the statistics, it's a fairly significant percentage of people who are discarding them. But then you look at what people like, let's say, Ivor Spedic from Case Western says, or other these other patients that get sensory perception restored mm -hmm. with neurally based prostheses, and they say, it's my hand. Right. And yeah. you see these patients that are able to, to have these devices for an extended time, but we're still running into the issue of how do we make this portable, getting it to people to bring home with them. Yeah. And so we're, we're still making progress on that. I think, I think I heard Case Western, they're doing that already with like take home drives. Yeah, yeah I, that's, that's really interesting. And I, I think that my guess would be that the biggest limiting factor to prosthetic control, just like anything in, in neurotech is like its functionality. Like how good is it actually? Like when, when does the cool factor wear off? Is it actually useful? But mm -hmm. yeah, I think once we get to the Luke Skywalker arm level stuff, then people won't be trading them in, but yeah. Cool. Hey, back to the movies. That's all that matters. Do we have any good? Uh, yeah, back to the movies. It's true. Hey, it's a great way to to inspire, right? Like I love. That's why we put it in our ethics video. It's it's a great way to think about ethics. It's a great way to inspire future stuff, whether it's you know good or scary. It's cool. Do you have any comments um, about these questions here? Uh, Computing brain says although we already rely on technology, it still feels as if it's a peripheral system. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, for you to be a cyborg, technology has to be a part of you in the same way that the rest of your body is. Yeah. Interesting take. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're more in line with Michael on that one. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah thank, thank you for the, thank you for putting that in. Um, so last question I have for you guys, and then we'll just chill on if, uh, anybody has uh, other questions? Is any sci-fi that that you like? Forrest, I'm going to start with you because I know exactly what you're going to say. <laughs> any sci-fi like about <laughs> neurotech or anything that you like? Maybe oh, man, involving I ghosts? I, you know. <laughs> well, well, there's that one, but man, I have a long list. Let me tell you. I mean, you guys will get to see some of those when you read the text of the um, of the actual written portion of the course. But good tease. Say, yes. 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 <laughs> um, the, the one that I think really y'all should watch, it's really old though, um, is the original Ghost in a Shell from like 1995, I believe. Uh, that particular film, amazing. It's like, they, they go into like what happens when you have 
a person who like they know that their brain is cybernetic to some extent, but they don't know what percentage, what percentage rather, and they don't know if they're a clone of themselves or if they are even themselves or if their memories were synthetic and created for them. So they're trying to struggle with the sense of identity. Who am I? And you know, we'll talk about about the ship of Theseus in the course too. So there's that too. To oh, about. good teasers. Yes, it's wonderful. <laughs> he. He talks about this movie all the time. You have to, you have to, okay, so I, I am like, I've, I'm only like 20 minutes in or something, and I promise you, Forrest, he'll watch the whole thing, but he references this all the time, so it better, it's, uh, I imagine it's a very good example of neuro, neurotech, so I recommend it. Um, all right, so I mean, that is all that we had formally, um, but we will stick around if there are any other questions. Um, unless there's anything else that people wanted to to throw in. Yeah, thank you all for for joining us. Obviously, we we really appreciate the support. Um, you know, we're sort of at a critical spot right now with the channel where we we broke 2,000 subscribers, so we're super excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we we're gonna keep this content coming. Uh, if you guys liked the the live stream uh, format, let us know as well. Um, you know, we we might do more of these in the future if enough people enjoy them. Um, but yeah, uh, send, make sure you send us uh, feedback and video uh, recommendations. That's over at www.bciguys.com slash support. Um, and I'll add a, 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 mess, a, a link to that in the chat right now. Yeah, and get some cool merch. If you help us out on Patreon too, we're, we're, we uh, spent some time earlier today figuring out what the benefits and stuff would be. So um, yeah, any way that you can, that you can help us out whether it's sharing, liking, or supporting us with Patreon or through merch, it's all very much appreciated. And thank you all so much again for, for coming today. We appreciate getting these questions and this was really fun for us. I think I can speak for all of us with that. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for coming. We'll just sit on here for a little bit if there are any questions, but, oh, Johnny Mnemonic, yeah, that's a great. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta watch that, I haven't yeah. seen it. That's a, that's a good example. I watched All this the part of a course actually. Our RIT had a course on like movies for neuro for neuroscience. Did they really movies for yes, neuroscience at RIT? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Iris Aswani, I think taught it. Oh, that makes sense. Cool. Oh, that's really cool. Interesting. It's like a film viewings class kind of thing for neuroscience. That's so, so that interesting. Cool. Yeah, we should we should do stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah. We I should... mean, the idea was you look at a movie. And then through the lens of the movie, you understand the neuroscience. So like what they would do is they would yeah. give us homework, go watch the movie and answer a couple of questions about what you saw, basically. So sort of like how I was telling you about the philosophy from the Ghost in the Shell, something similar, but for all of the other movies, except go beyond the philosophy. Let's look at the science, the engineering. How do you make something like this? How does it work, right? Yeah. How, how does an MRI make an image of the brain? Right, like, like working through the math of that and even showing us the software. We actually mm -hmm. got to see examples of that. That was really fascinating. Cool. That's right. awesome. Well, I gotta, gotta find that course. That's really cool. Well, I got a recent yeah. one. Watched last week. What? Okay. Yeah. Foreign film. It's French. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oxygen. Oh, I started watching that, uh, but it's I had to I jump off for something. Was it good? Yeah, it's freaking it. Well, I think it's pretty good. It's like... It's dumb. Um, but playing with the idea of cryogenic chambers and um, like big companies cool. putting that over people. And it's like, it takes place all in the chamber the whole time. And it's pretty, uh, it's borderline horror and it's really good. And that's like playing with the, she has like an AI in there that she's communicating with. That's not just like evil. So. Interesting you say that Mike, cause I actually encountered two relatively recent examples of neurotechnology and media. One of them was um, Eden which I think just came out on Netflix. It's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. it, where they, I think there was a person who translated their, their mind and then put it into a machine. Mm -hmm. was like the idea. Ooh, okay. So that's kind of fascinating. And then there was a, a game that I played recently where someone used like basically some spaces within the bones of the skull behind the eye to create a, an optical implant like for their eye that could then interface with their brain and then feed information back beyond just visual feedback. Whoa. <laughs> I thought that was pretty wild. And it could even talk to them. So like, I was like, what? <laughs> that's, that's, that's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Oh and it was God. giving them like infrared vision and like zooming in capabilities and all that stuff. Like, 
Like, this is what I mean when I say like beyond what we could possibly do without these prostheses, like imagine the possibilities. Yeah. Hugh Hare at MIT is always going on about, it's like, I can make myself whatever I want to be. Like what? This is yeah. it's awesome. It's amazing. Or like it's being able to see like, away. like the infrared or ultraviolet or ultraviolet yeah. uh, spectrum. Yeah. That'd be really cool. Yeah. We're doing a video on that right now. I'm working with uh, a volunteer writer that just jumped on to talk about sensory substitution. We're going to look at weird senses that animals have and then imagine what that would be like to be human. But that'd Whoa. be cool. And thank you to, I see uh, nice messages from James, Leonardo, uh, Gianluca, and Maria. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Awesome support. We've got an awesome uh, audience right now. So it's it's great to see um, all the kind words. Yeah. All right, well, we'll give you one more minute for, uh, for questions, and then we'll jump off here. We're getting hit by a really bad storm right now. Are you? It's so bad outside, <laughs> yeah. How's your dog? Just ended. What's what's up, Harrison? Oh yeah, because you guys are both in Pennsylvania, right? So yeah, it's probably. The, I am. So it's oh, yeah, the same. yeah. I'm also in Pennsylvania right now, and it was did you like get the, a monsoon. Uh, did you get the stuff. Did you get the the tornado warning? I didn't get any warning. Um, is there is there a tornado coming towards Pittsburgh? What area of Pennsylvania are we talking? We're we're in Central PA, <laughs> right by uh, State, oh, okay. State College. You're a little ways away. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad right now. Worried we're gonna lose power. <laughs> All right. We'll, see, well, before that, then we will we will cut the stream before you lose power. I'm amazed that your dog hasn't been barking like crazy though, with the oh, thunderstorm no. and stuff going on. He's so more let's... he's more of a cuddle nervous dog <laughs> instead of a he's bark so nervous. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, a big thank you again to everyone who has been taking the course, watching our videos, who came here today. We really appreciate it. Um, take care and thank you all so much.